The pelvic girdle, which is also sometimes referred to as the hip girdle, is going to be responsible for attaching the lower limbs to the axial skeleton, transmits the entire weight of the upper body to the lower limbs, and also supports a lot of the visceral organs of the pelvis. And in this area of the body, this is where we're going to find the strongest ligaments of the body. And it's important that you can kind of compare and contrast the shoulder joint with the hip joint. So as we discussed in a previous lecture video, the shoulder joint has a shallow glenoid cavity or fossa. And this is going to allow for more movement, but also less protection. So in this case, the, um, hip, the hip joint is going to be much more stable. And one of the reasons that it's much more stable is because there is a deep acetabulum. The acetabulum is going to be the depression where the head of the femur fits into. So um, let's go over some of these important bony landmarks that you need to know for lecture. And make sure that you check out the rotatable pelvis, which is located in the mastering A and P study area. So first of all, it's important that you know where the sacroiliac joint is, the SI joint. Also, the coxal bone is going to be made up of three fused bones, the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. And these three bones together they are the coxal bone, but the two of them are called the co os coxae, and each one would be an os coxa bone. Now notice you can see the sacrum and the coccyx in this view. Remember they are part of the axial skeleton, but the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium are all part of the appendicular skeleton. Now when you put your hands on your hip, the highest point where you would rest your hands would be on the iliac crest, crest meaning highest point, and if you, if you follow the iliac crest to where it sort of forms a point that's called the anterior superior iliac spine, then you also have the anterior inferior iliac spine, the pelvic brim, the acetabulum is the depression where the head of the femur fits in. The pubic symphysis is the slightly movable joint where there's a fibrocartilage pad. And these spines are very important parts, especially for professions like physical therapy. And oftentimes they are simply abbreviated. The anterior superior iliac spine is often abbreviated as the ACIS and the anterior inferior iliac spine is abbreviated as the AIIS. Now on our next slide we can see some more of the bony landmarks and we can see the um, arcuate line and the arcuate line is located right here. The um, previous slide is um, the arcuate line would sort of be drawn in at about this level. And the reason that is important because it defines where the pelvic brim is and the area that is located superior to the arcuate line is going to be called the, um, in the false pelvis and below that would be the true pelvis. So this area down here would be the true pelvis, and the area that is above the arcuate line would be the false pelvis. So let's go through and highlight some of the important parts that you need to know. So uh, notice that we have a lateral view of the right hip bone and a medial view of the right hip bone. So it's the same bone, just looking at it from two different sides. And um, first of all, you can see the iliac crest. And the iliac crest would also be located in this area at the top. But the area where the iliac crest comes to a point in the front is the anterior superior, superior iliac spine. Where it comes to the point in the back is the posterior superior iliac spine. 
and then the posterior inferior iliac spine, and those can be abbreviated. There's also the greater sciatic notch. The greater sciatic notch is a, an important location because it's where the sciatic nerve passes and enters into the thigh. The sciatic nerve is one of the thickest nerves that we have in our body. We also see the acetabulum, and the acetabulum is a meeting point where all three fused bones are located. So on this diagram, if we think of the acetabulum, kind of like a pizza pie, this is where the ilium meets the ischium, as well as the pubis. So the acetabulum is actually a part of three different bones. And as I mentioned, the posterior superior iliac spine is abbreviated PSIS. The posterior inferior iliac spine is abbreviated PIIS. The obturator foramen is going to be a, the hole for the obturator nerve. And as I mentioned, the greater sciatic notch is going to be a notch where the sciatic nerve passes through. The ischial tuberosities are important bony landmarks to know. When you are sitting, you are sitting on your ischial tuberosities. And remember, tuberosity is a point of attachment for a muscle. And these are going to be important attachments for the gluteal muscles. And we also have the obturator foramen, which I've already mentioned, the arcuate line, which you can see here. And again, you can see the same thing shown in the diagrams right below it. These are just showing um, bone models that aren't, aren't a diagram like you see at the top. This slide is showing some of the major differences between the male and the female pelvis. And there are quite a few differences. One of the major differences would be that the female pelvis is going to be adapted for childbearing. So some of these changes would be that the female pelvis is going to be wider, shallower, lighter, and rounder than that of the male. So the female is going to be um, wider, more shallow, more round than the male pelvis. Um, and it's going to be large enough for the infant's large head to exit at birth. So there's some significant differences which are defined in this specific um, table that you see in your textbook. One other thing that I want to point out is the pelvic brim and, again, the arcuate line, which I've pointed out before on a previous diagram. But if we're drawing a line around the arcuate line, again, the true pelvis is the region that is inferior to the pelvic brim. So this would be the true pelvis down here below this line. And the true pelvis is going to be um, important because it's almost entirely surrounded by bone. kind of forms this deep bowl that contains the pelvic organs and its dimensions um, are going to be critical for the delivery of a healthy baby. And then again the false pelvis is going to be the area that is superior to the arcuate line. The pelvic inlet is the pelvic brim, and its widest dimension is from right to left along the frontal plane. And you can see that's quite different in the female than the male. So let's go through some of those differences that we see here between the two. And as you can see on the left-hand column, we have the female. And the female pelvis is going to be slightly tilted forward and the male is not going to be tilted forward nearly as much. Um, and one of the other big differences is the bone th thickness is going to be different in the female. It's going to be lighter, thinner, and smoother. 
but much heavier in the male. The bones are heavier and thicker. And another difference is where the acetabulum are located. They're smaller and fall farther apart in the female, but larger and closer together in the male. And one of the other big differences is the pubic arch and pubic angle. And this will be especially important in lab in helping you to differentiate the male from the female. If the angle is greater than 90 degrees, if it is more of an obtuse angle, if it's broader, it would be more rounded. It's female. If it's less than um, 90 degrees, then it would be, if it's more acute, then it would be a male pelvis. So those are some of the significant differences there. And you can see the same thing shown on this diagram. We're looking at examples of males and female pelvises, one from one view that's a lateral view at the top. And again, you can see the, um, the sacrum is wider and shorter and more accentuated in the female. Um, the coccyx is more movable for the pelvic inlet. So you can see a definite difference in the space here um, that's located between the sacrum and where the coccyx bone would be. Also the pelvic inlet, the, where the pelvic brim would be, is much wider and oval from side to side in the female versus the male. So a significant difference here. Also the ischial tuberosities are going to be shorter in the female and further apart. Whereas in the male, the ischial tuberosities are going to be longer, sharper, and more and pointed more medially, as you can see here. These would be the ischial tuberosities right here. Again, the area that we're kind of sitting on, where our gluteal muscles are attached. The lower limb is composed up of the thigh, which is the femur bone. And the femur bone is the largest, longest, and strongest bone in our body. And the leg is the tibia, the fibula, as well as the foot, which is the tarsals, the metatarsals, as well as the phalanges. The different parts of the femur that you're responsible for knowing would be, first of all, the trochanters. You learned the name trochanter back in chapter six. And the trochanters are used for the femur, and they are in relationship to the head. So if it's lateral to the head or superior to the head, it would be the greater trochanter. The lesser trochanter would be inferior to the head as well as the neck. The neck is a region where there's a lot of fractures that can occur during osteoporosis. There's also the gluteal tuberosity. This is going to be a point of attachment for the gluteal muscles as is evident by the name. You also need to know the patella or kneecap. You don't have to know any specific parts of the patella. You also need to know the condyles. Remember the term condyle also applies to the humerus but we have had specific names for the ones on the humerus. These, these are referred to simply as condyles. There are lateral epicondyles as well as the medial epicondyle. So on our next slide is showing the tibia. When you look at a tibia, you can identify whether it is the right tibia or the left tibia. So you need to be able to identify whether the femur is a left or right femur, the humerus is a left or right humerus, as well as the tibia. And you can tell that by identifying where the medial malleolus is. So the medial malleolus has to be pointing, obviously, to the medial side. And if you can identify where the anterior surface is and the posterior surface is. The tibial tuberosity is a very important landmark because it's where a, an important muscle called the tibialis anterior is attached. If you um, put your hand, your fingers right below your patella, and you point your toes to the sky, you're going to feel a bump right on the tibial tuberosity. And that's because that's where the tibialis anterior muscle is attached. The terms condyle also apply to the tibia. There's a medial condyle as well as a lateral condyle. There's also the head of the fibula, 
as well as the lateral malleolus. So there's no such thing as a lateral malleolus on the tibia, it's only on the fibula. So those are important landmarks to know. Now you can see that there's an x-ray that's shown on your diagram and this x-ray is of what's called a POTS fracture and the POTS fracture occurs at the distal end of the fibula, the tibia, or both and it is a common sports injury in this area. Very, very painful. So now for the foot, and again, any of these, these uh, notes for the animation, I encourage you to again to watch in Mastering A&P Study Area. There's rotatable bones that are shown. And when we look at the foot, these bones of the tarsus area are called tarsals. And these tarsals, remember, are examples of short bones. And there are some specific names for them. There are seven tarsals in total, and the body weight is carried primarily by the two largest tarsals, and those would be the talus. The talus is going to be the more superior one, and the largest one, the inferior one, is going to be called the calcaneus. So as you can see here, the talus is superior. This is looking at a superior view, so we see the talus the calcaneus underneath it. The calcaneal tendon or the Achilles tendon is attached to the calcaneus bone. There's also a tarsal called the cuboid which is shaped like a cube. And there are some, there is a bone called the navicular and then there are cuneiforms and they are named again according to directional terms. There is a lateral cuneiform, an intermediate cuneiform, and there is also a medial cuneiform, which we can see on the superior view. And then we also have the metatarsals as well as the phalanges, which are both long bones. So again, just like in the fingers, the metatarsals are named from one through five. So the big toe or the great toe, also called the hallux, would be number one. And then we have two, three, four, and five. Five would be the small toe. And then, so they're named by one through five. And then we use the directional terms, distal, middle, and proximal, when we talk about the phalanges. Now there are arches of the foot as well. And there are three different arches. There's a medial arch, a transverse arch, and a lateral arch. And these arches are going to be very important. They account for a lot of strength, arch support, and they're maintained by the interlocking shapes of the foot bone by very strong ligaments. And they're also maintained by the pull of tendons during muscular activity. The ligaments and the muscle tendons provide a a certain amount of springiness. Uh, in general, the arches are going to give or stretch slightly when we apply a weight to them. And all of our arches are designed differently. Some of us have low arches. Some of us have high arches. And in different footprints, you, you see a different um, design from the heel to the head of the first metatarsal because of our arches. The talus is the keystone of the arch where it originates at the calcaneus. The um, lateral longitudinal arch is very, very low. And they have certain machines where you can see the design of a person's arch. So again, there's two longitudinal ones. There's a medial and a lateral longitudinal one. And there's also a transverse arch that we see. And so when you buy a shoe that has more of an arch support, that arch support is going to be designed for your specific arches.